This is session 5.C, Technology, Future Relationship Between Humanity and Technology. And the first paper is Timothy Wallace, who is retired from MIT Lincoln Labs on effects, side effects, and risks of the Internet of Things. All right. <clears throat> this is actually the fifth in a series of talks I've given over the last uh, five years. Um, you know, in, in the evolution of computer products, you know, the hardware industry has to promote new products to stimulate demand. So in the 80s, of course, we had the PCs, and, uh, you know, laptops really took off in the 90s. And, uh, you know, the iPhone introduction in 2007 really jump-started the smartphones. And most people who need one of these things have one. There's about 2 billion computers in use and about 7 billion smartphones. And so, you know, these products mature, the market becomes saturated. You've got to come up with new products. And uh, the Internet of Things is uh, one of those products that the industry has a lot of hope for. The so-called smart devices and sensors. And, you know, the, the marketing points are, you know, you can observe and control your home devices over the Internet with your computer or your phone. Industry can instrument their equipment and processes to improve efficiency. Or governments can observe and control infrastructure with uh, IoT devices. There's about 10 billion IoT devices in use today. Now, to get a little better gut feeling what these are, if you search Amazon for the single word smart, you get a screen like this one on the right. <clears throat> and um, some of these things you probably can understand what it is. Here's a picture frame. You can send pictures from your phone or your computer to it, and you put it on your wall. There's a water leak detector. It'll probably alert you if there's a water leak. And, you know, these... These um, light bulbs and, and power outlets can be turned on and off, maybe to control your security lights or something. Uh, this one here, you know, it gives me pause. It's a smart shower controller. Probably you can control the temperature, you know. And if I had teenagers, I really wouldn't want this in my house. <laughs> but um, the smart soap dispenser, that might stump a few people, too. But it turns out that you're supposed to wash your hands for 20 seconds, and this thing will, you can select the time interval, select a musical piece, which will last that long, and you can program how much soap comes in when you push your hand under in case you have bigger hands or something. So they're very critical to our comfort and, uh, and everything, of course. <clears throat> now, the big picture, you know, is created by the IoT devices in aggregate, not, you know, an individual shower controller or, or light bulb. And, you know, we're really putting ourselves under surveillance when we use the IoT. And the commercial entities are also putting us under surveillance the same way. And, uh, of course, governments are surveilling their populations using IoT devices. And the hackers are out there, too. They can cause harm. Here's a few uh, examples here. You know, Amazon has the ring doorbells, but this is a court case where somebody was spying on the customers um, with those devices. Uh, this is uh, one about automated license plate readers. And uh, you can buy information on where, where millions of cars are going around the U.S. by these automated license plate readers. And the headline says, four companies to watch out for. That's a business site, you know, Advise Analytics. You know, you might want to buy their stock. But, you know, I, I'd say watch out for them in a different sense. Um, to the right, we're going to hear more about this. But here's a case where... Uh, the Chinese, you know, have had issues with the Uyghurs, and it's been called a genocide by a number of people, including our government. And here's a, a Uyghur recognition as a service. So the, all the little ILT cameras, uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, and that was the introduction to what the Internet of Things really is. So we're going to talk about misuses of the IoT. You know, anything can be misused, and we'll get that out of the way. But, you know, the bigger issue are the problems when it's used as intended. Um, and then we'll briefly talk about the Christian perspective and, and summarize. Well, the security issues with the Internet of Things. Um, you know, there's pervasive devices there, 10 billion of them. Security is not always the foremost thing when you're make, building and selling these things. Keeping costs low is always the most important thing as an engineer when you're going to stamp out, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or hopefully millions of these things. And not all IoT software can be easily updated, you know, as easy as your phone or your computer. Here's a pretty interesting article if you want to delve a little more deeply into it here from Communications of the ACM on standards to secure the IoT. It says, existing security standards do not always offer sufficient protection to secure the Internet of Things. Well, 
you know, as engineers, we like to say the great thing about standards is there are so many of them. You can always find one that's just exactly what you need. And, you know, that's probably <coughs> still a valid uh, point. Now, the government did get this IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020 passed. But this is for uh, stuff for IoT devices the government buys. So probably knowing that instead of being a $10 device, it's a $500 device. Same device, just with a government certified sticker on it, you know. But, um, <coughs> now, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, um, the Biden administration launched this cyber trust mark. So they're trying to get, I think, by executive order, IoT security for the rest of us. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Now, this is a famous, very famous attack. Uh, illustrates the issues of the Internet of Things. This is from thehackernews.com, if you want to check it out. Uh, the casino got hacked through their internet-connected fish tank thermometer here, their aquarium. Somebody got into this uh, aquarium thermometer, hacked the local network, and then exfiltrated a list of high rollers and their personal financial information. That could be valuable to somebody. This took place in 2018. We don't know what casino. This is not the fish tank. Uh, it's just artist conception of a casino fish tank. But you know, other such events are likely still happening. Most of this kind of stuff, completely confidential. Now, you know, there are digital locks for cars and houses on the Internet of Things, and they're becoming more popular. You may have gone to hotels, you know, they're using them. Some apartments are starting to use them. You can buy one for your own house. Some newer cars use them. And uh, some have been hacked. Uh, digital Trends article at the right, you know, shows that uh, some Tesla cars and certain digital locks were hacked through a kind of an interesting uh, technique that's beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, little URLs down there at the bottom. Um, baby monitors are always a great story, and we've hear, heard about them for years, but now it's with TikTok that we hear about them. This woman is a TikTok influencer, and um, uh, this is her, this is not her kid. Her kid was three years old, and the way the story goes, he unplugged his camera. He kept unplugging it. His mom plugged it back in. He said, no, I'm tired of talking to that guy in the middle of the night, because they're usually pranksters. They hack the camera, and they swear at the babies. They, they just, they're not really aiming at the babies, they're aiming at the parents. They're pranksters for the most part. And the parents are so horrified, they usually just throw the device away, you know, in a second and report it on TikTok. That, that's the correct expression, by the way. That's her real expression in, in relating this story. It, it, you know, with the right kind of passwords and, and setup, you can mitigate that. You could still, uh, still use it. But, you know, people say that the young don't need these kinds of talks because they are already very digital literate. I mean, this kid is three and he knows how to stop Internet of Things hacks, you know, already. So you know, that, that shows the, the truth of that. I, I find these stories, it can be a little amusing, but I did read one just a couple weeks ago that some um, child porn purveyors actually were linking to some of these cameras. So I mean, it could get more serious as well. Well, let's talk about my IoT. You know, it's always good to personalize a talk if you can. You know, you start in my garage. I got three potential IoT devices in my garage. I got the garage opener. Well, you know, my old openers were hit by lightning about five years ago, and so I saved $40 by getting non-IoT openers that are not on the Internet, so people in Bulgaria can't open my garage um, if they hack it. Um, and I also got an electric car here. I got the, uh, the plug-in hybrid Pacifica, and I got a level 2 charger here that's not on the Internet of Things. You plug it in, it charges. You unplug it. You know, it's um, pretty easy to do. And, um, you know, I, I did not subscribe to Sirius XM Guardian. I saved $20 a month, and I prevented hackers from unlocking my car and or turning it on and off, as it says you can do here through the app. Yeah, you know, they may or may not hack me. Chrysler can hack me, but, um, you know, it's, it's a step. Now, if I change my mind, Wise will sell me a controller I can retrofit on my relatively new garage door opener for $50, can put this thing on there, and it'll make my put my um, garage door openers on the Internet of Things. I won't be buying that. Okay, now in the house, you know, I've got some uh, IoT potential IoT devices in my house. This is a smart LG TV. If you look down here at the bottom, there's a little switch with two red buttons. When I set this thing up, I did not give it any Wi-Fi passwords. I plugged it in to my network uh, router in the basement. And so and we're not streaming anything. We just unplug that. If we're watching over the air TV, we just unplug it. So we transmit less data um, back to LG. I have an UFI uh, camera I needed to monitor a family member a couple of years ago. And uh, 
But this one does not have any mandatory uh, internet connections, and it stores the stuff right on the on the card there. <coughs> um, and what I don't have, it's really more notable. I don't have the ring doorbell, the digital locks, and so on. Um, now, you know, XKCD, you know, for you tech, tech people, usually has, you know, covers every subject. And uh, this is a case where tech support gets a call on the Internet of Things, where the IoT thermostat is just not booting. And, you know, there's no solution to this. It's hopeless. And that's, but then it can get worse. You know, it always gets worse in the comics, you know. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there's just nothing you can do. So it's, it's a pretty good combo straight so you can go from bad to worse with the Internet of Things. Okay, now I'll get to a little more serious part of the talk, the problems when the IoT is used as intended. I mean, we're in Toronto, so I have to talk about this Sidewalks Labs Smart City of Toronto in 2017. If you live here, you probably heard about this thing. They're going to heavily instrument it, ubiquitous sensing for a more efficient city, record all the data, model project, be a gateway to larger projects. This is, the illustrations were very fanciful, you know, I don't think all these kites are going to be flying there in most days, but... But um, this is a story of architectural record about this great system. Now, 2018, they hit some speed bumps. Privacy advocates criticized it because they didn't guarantee to limit the data, anonymization, um, and some of the advisory board members resigned. This kind of shows where this site was actually going to be um, in Toronto. <coughs> uh, story from the Atlantic. Well, 2020, they canceled it, and the pandemic was a handy excuse. But yeah, I think increasing opposition might have been a factor. Now, the business case was threatened because um, they wanted to get money from the, the city. That wasn't looking good, and the public wasn't perhaps as excited. And they wanted to sell a lot of data from this to make money, and that was also uh, threatened. Now, I want to recommend this book, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Zuboff. Um, quite a, it's about 500 pages, and, uh, but they're not real fine print. It's not going to take you weeks to read this thing. Um, this first paragraph is a summary of kind of what she means by surveillance capitalism. It says that unilaterally claims human experience as free raw material for translation of behavioral data. Although some of these data are applied to product or service improvement, the rest are declared as a proprietary behavioral surplus fed into advanced manufacturing processes known as machine intelligence, which is on my card, and fabricated into prediction products that anticipate what you will do now, soon, and later to monetize it. But to me, I found a, a kind of a fun uh, quote here from someone she interviewed, a systems architect. The IoT is inevitable like getting to the Pacific Ocean was inevitable. It's manifest destiny. 98% of the things in the world are not connected, so we're going to connect them. Could be a moisture sensor that sits in the ground. It could be your liver. That's your IoT. The next step is what we do with the data. We'll visualize it, make sense of it, and monetize it. That's our IoT. And um, it's a good book. I recommend it. And it actually even has a, a section on the Chinese Communist Party surveillance, which this next book, also recommended a much shorter book, um, is about. And uh, Zuboff doesn't cover as much detail as Chin and Lin. But, um, I mean, I think most of us know totalitarian governments are notorious for surveillance. And, uh, you know, political opponents and disfavor organizations are often targeted. Potential separatist regions or peoples get special attention. And China is the largest and richest totalitarian uh, government that we have right now in the world. Of course, they've targeted the Falun Gong movement, foreign NGOs and religious groups, and the Uyghurs, of course, is, is a big thing. They're not the only offender. Uh, even more democratic countries are using pervasive surveillance. And China will sell you some really nice hardware and software packages with big cloud uh, visual recognition. Um, now, I want to, um, there's a great article here on the IPVM website, which is a site on physical security about the Shanghai police tracking Uyghurs and journalists visiting the, uh, the Xinjiang, which is the, the Uyghur region. Usually you get there through Shanghai, it's not that close. Um, so the cloud processes the data in these, all these IoT cameras. And uh, so they've got a really big database. And in this case, they have a database of journalists and individually, and Uyghurs as a race, with which they identify, they track them in Xinjiang or Shanghai to see where they're going. And, you know, people are often um, not uncommon for them to be, uh, um, you know, detained and interrogated. But here's an actual screen capture of the surveillance software. 
So maybe if you're in some other country you want to buy, maybe this isn't their marketing materials, I'm not sure. But um, some stuff's highlighted here. Special personnel screening mode, yeah, helpful instructions in English and Chinese. So you can find foreign journalists with an interest in Xinjiang. And uh, this is the Uyghur, you know, spot Uyghurs coming to Shanghai. And then you can uh, interrogate them or whatever it is you need to do. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, let's um, briefly talk about the Christian perspective. Now, I have to admit that um, <clears throat> I read those previous two books I recommend. And, uh, um, you know, people talk about the loving gaze of God. Um, there's a few verses here that, um, you know, come to mind. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Even the IOT, you could say. Now, it's sort of a regional surveillance here. And then Hagar, you know, had a, was exiled to the desert a couple times, and God always appeared to her, which, you know, is pretty cool. She didn't have a lot of power as a foreigner, you know, a slave and a woman uh, back in the culture. But, you know, it says, you are the God who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. So God's surveilling the individuals. And, uh, of course, in Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. So I think, uh, you know, you can say that, uh, you know, God is watching uh, the whole earth and all of us individuals. And that's a good thing with the, under the loving gaze of God. Um, you know, surveillance on earth is all about the motives. Now, uh, this guy here is uh, Mark Ireland. He's a cleric from the U.K. And this book is only published in the U.K. You cannot even buy it on Amazon. That's how obscure I'm, I'm delving into for the, only for the ASA while I go this deep. I didn't read this book, but I did watch the interview uh, with this guy. Seemed pretty interesting. And he also recommended Eric Stoddard, The Common Gaze, another U.K. cleric. And so this is actually a response to the book. And the biggest, I think the biggest um, point in the book is that surveillance that exploits the vulnerable should be avoided. Excessive, you know, policing, for example, uh, in minority or poor areas. I think most Christians know which motives are problematic, and especially this audience. I don't need to probably take this too far. Well, in summary, I thought I'd summarize all five talks that I've given on some, some related stuff here because um, I can. Anyway, 2018, we talked about AI, and the point uh, I made was that artificial stupidity and misuse of over-marketed AI is the real problem. And I'm standing on that you know, five years later. And um, I think every time someone's killed by a full self-driving car, a few more people agree with me, at least in their immediate family. Um, 2019, we talked about cyber. Said that, you know, hubris and capitalism have created highly secure infrastructure we all use, which is, you know, smartphones and the Internet, uh, among other things, perhaps the Internet and things. Uh, in 2021, we talked about social media and said companies monetizing our attention were creating serious social problems. And we talked about the algorithms powering some of these, uh, some of these companies. And now we talked last year about bias in AI. You know, algorithms marketed as saving money while reducing bias are often more likely to increase it. You can check them out on the ASA website if you missed any of those. Now, the IoT sounds like the first hardware talk, but the real issue is the data collected. And the surveillance power, you know, largely rests with the corporations here. Even the license plate readers are run by corporations. But um, our legal structures are really aimed at government. We're very worried about the government being too powerful ever since, you know, we got free from the British. But, you know, the surveillance power rests with the government uh, in autocratic regimes for the most part. So digital technology is having tremendous effects and side effects here and worldwide. And you know, I'm happy that ASA is continuing to discuss these issues. And you know, we had a, a good talk from Joanna, and uh, you know, we're going to hear a little more today. That's it. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to suggest at least one constructive use of uh, I, uh, of this uh, Internet of Things. Uh, as we know, gun deaths in this country are the largest in, in, in the United States are the largest in the world, and it's been increasing to the largest source of death among young people, uh, gun deaths. Well, it's very unlikely political that we're going to get uh, uh, gun legislation, but if we could have a, uh, each of these automatic rifles that are, uh, are killing so many people, if we could have them have a, a, a digital device where we could track each gun that's been bought, and uh, through surveillance, we, we should 
be able to predict when some of these, we might be able to head off a lot of these gun deaths uh, through, through, uh, through surveillance. We might be able to fire them from Bulgaria, too. I, I would say that um, I think the trigger locks and the personalization stuff, reading your fingerprints, which some people do, that's a good thing. I would not want my gun on the Internet of Things. Uh, <laughs> well, about, you're a good guy. <laughs> not, not a bad guy. All right. Next question. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so do you think from a personal perspective that we should be avoiding, like, connecting our things to the Internet? Oh, no. I connect. I mean, I have the smartphone in my pocket. And I connect a lot of stuff to the Internet. But I think that when it comes to the IoT, which connects the physical world to the Internet, um, that um, that's where I try to avoid it. My smartphone, I don't do financial stuff on my smartphone except for, you know, summoning a Lyft ride, try never to enter my credit card. I would do no banking there. I do them only on the Linux box at home. It's pretty secure, and I have it turned off 90% of the time. So, you know, I, I try to minimize it. But the physical, when you, when you take the physical world to the Internet, that raises, you know, uh, risks to a little higher level. I try to avoid that. Can you, can you imagine any positive um, applications of IoT, like citizen science or like remote sensors in the ocean that are monitoring temperature and currents or, you know, um, IoT for Earth kind of climate monitoring or... Well, I do have my solar system here, you know, okay. and, uh, you know, that has to connect to the power company. They have to be able to monitor, control it. I've been doing connected solutions events this week, which where they discharge my battery to avoid firing up a gas peaking plant, try to help save the planet. So, you know, tens of thousands of us battery owners in Massachusetts are contributing. And uh, so it shows me that my battery was charged, you know, from 20 to 40 percent today. And it's a pretty sunny day in, in Boston. So, yeah, there's a lot of good things, a lot of good things. But we shouldn't just believe, you know, drink the Kool-Aid and believe that everything like, you know, a soap dispenser on the Internet of Things or a shower controller, that everything is good because we're putting it on the Internet of Things, because once it gets on there, um, people can hack it from anywhere. And, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world, probably, if uh, someone hacks my soap dispenser and it's, you know, playing obscene, uh, an obscene song and I try to, you know, but I don't, need the, I don't need the aggravation and I'm going to save five bucks if I don't have one like that, probably. So that's, that's what I'd recommend. Is that on? Oh, yeah. There you go. Um, is there any progress in data ownership of all of this stuff, you know, I mean, some of that, I think, which would have to be legislative. Plenty of progress in China. All the data is owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Correct, yeah. And here, you know, it's a little more confusing, but I mean, the companies that do it, the, there's not a lot of laws. We don't have privacy like they have in Europe, you know, or possibly Canada. I'm not sure. With, I'm not that up in the Canadian laws. So the U.S., we don't have a lot of privacy laws. So in general, you don't have the right to privacy. And so, yeah, people are talking about it, and, you know, I, I support the concept, but, uh, yeah. All right, let's thank Tim again.